of background, then I'll get off the precision planning side of it. It's a company out of America, started by a farmer, um, and that's where it grew. It's grown from, grown from three people that used to operate in the garage, Greg Souter in the garage on his family farm, um, with two other guys, Ken Dill, I'm not sure the third guy's name, but Ken's only just left the company. Um, and they started back in 1991, I think, just modifying a few metering systems and then started doing their neighbours. Um, and it just grew from there to the point now we're doing full electronics and Greg sold the company now, but it still has got the majority of the staff that are there um, knew Greg and, you know, went there... I'll be careful what I say, but a lot of religious guys that work there and... You know, guys that went to church with Greg, farm with Greg, and they're all still there at Precision. Fantastic group of guys, about 360 and 70 of them are engineers, and probably 80 of the, those engineer, 80 of the people that work there are farming. They go home to their father's farm or their brother's farm or their own farm, use the products, and that's why yeah, I got back into selling a bit of gear. I sold gear years ago down in Victoria and got sick of selling equipment because... I was selling what I had to sell and moved out and went back to the farm and found this equipment and I like selling it because it works and it does a good job. So, <clears throat> um, The main reason, and thanks very much for having me too, um, it's great to come out here and it's an area we don't get out to that much, um, don't quite go, come this far west, we haven't got too many customers out this way, but um, great to come out and get the opportunity to come out and talk a little bit about what we're doing at home. Um, yeah, mouldy hybrid. Um, the theme of the day, I think um, Scott was trying to get me to talk about, was the mouldy hybrid we're using at home and why we're doing it and um, how we can improve different soil types on our farm. So on our farm, we've got small farm 390 hectares, um, all in one block, um, no fences on the inside or the outside of it pretty much. Um, it's all black soil and five years ago I would have said, in fact I asked my father five years ago what the, did we have variable soil and what his opinion was and he said no, it's basically all the one soil type um, and um, I was talking to Sally before and I mentioned that I overheard him having a conversation with a friend after we've just finished this multi hybrid planting and he was explaining how when he saw the metres change variety as he was going through the paddock that it just made sense to him. And the turnaround from um, my father thinking we had dead even soil type to that variability is huge. Um, and I'm sure he'd agree that same as I would. Um, I don't want to go into be able, I don't want to go into the paddock anymore and not have the ability to variable rate something if I need to. Might not always need to do that, but I want to be able to do it if I can. Um, so what we've got, um, precision planning, I've got a range of products, but the one that I've used um, is multi-hybrid, so it's basically two metres to go on a summer crop planter, so just to clear it up, I'm mainly talking about what we did uh, the sorghum season just gone at home, where we used a traditional planting metre to plant seed in the ground except our meter that we use is electric drive so it gives it the, it's you've got the ability to do full variable rate with it um the multi multi hybrid meter you'll see a picture of it in a minute but it's basically two meters back to back so if you imagine one meter facing this way the other meter right opposite it facing this way except they're sharing a common seed tube so the internals of it we just got two discs turning and as one turns off, the other one will turn on, and we can, therefore, if we need to, we can, um, if we need to, we can stop one, plant one variety, and the next one can turn on simultaneously, so we don't have a gap in the paddock. In fact, they use um, precision blending when they're testing, they use varieties that have different coloured stems, uh, so they can see that simultaneous start, stop, um, so we can see whether there's a gap in that metering system. Um, so it gives you gives the ability um, at home. I'll talk about don't not meaning to pick on any um, uh, different seed companies, but we planted Pacific Seeds 
variety Scorpio and Taurus. Um, can, I, can I just ask how many guys in here summer crop growers or winter crop? Um, so Pacific Seeds um, have got a couple of varieties that MR Scorpio and MR Taurus. Taurus is one that's let us down in the past. Uh, sorry, Scorpio is one that's let us down in the past. In fact, we had quite a failure with it. So it was a variety that I would have said I wouldn't plant again um, because of that reason. We had quite a lot of it fall down on us and actually grow that. But as five years, four years ago, we had a season where it grew that hard that um, didn't have any go left in the plant to um, put a head on. So by, ha by you being able to use the Moly hybrid hoppers, it gave us the ability to say, right, where are the best soil types on the farm? Um, map those areas and only put Scorpio in those areas. Scorpio is almost an irrigated variety, I'd say, um, or something we need. It's a variety we need to put into a real deep soil with lots of moisture. Otherwise, it's got the ability when it gets to the end, it doesn't know how to control itself. So it just continues to pump grain into the head and it steals and robs all that from the stem of the plant and falls over. So um, with the multi-hybrid hoppers, I'll turn that around. Um, we needed a way to work out, we needed a way to work out what we were going to base our two variety changes on. Um, we're fairly new to it. We've been collecting yield data for probably close to 10 years. Um, only for the first five we were just collecting it because the header could do it, so we did. Um, for the last five we've been collecting it because we've had a lot better yield monitoring system and um, we've started to seriously look at that and look at the trends between sorghum and wheat yields and where the good and bad patches are. Still with no idea what to do in mind with that data, but been collecting that information. Um, but I didn't really want to base my variety changed on harvest data only. I wanted something more permanent, like some, some way of measuring the soil to know that when we go through this zone, I don't know why it's changing, but the soil is changing here, and that gave me sort of more solid base to do something on, rather than a yield map that gave me, there's, there's a lot of a lot of variabilities with the yield, like if we look at the Scorpio map going in a couple of slides forward, Scorpio has got the ability to do really well in a good season and also really bad in a bad season. So there's, you need a lot of no, your own knowledge there. Where, so the way we collected the data, Adrian, as you can tell, is a really good talker. He talked me into buying a Veris machine. Um, and we did have in mind to go and do a bit of contracting with it, but we got a little bit busy to do that. So we've got one of these used series Veris. Um, the one thing, it cost us a few dollars to buy that, but the one thing I did like is I collected up my own data and while I did that, I learned so much about the farm. Um, as I went backwards and forwards through the paddock, I sort of learned, learned a lot about my own soil. So it was a huge benefit to us. So um, Adrian explained here what he did with that information. I'm not, I haven't got the ability to generate maps. So Adrian put layers over layers over layers and at the end of the day, Adrian sent me back three maps. Um, and this probably goes back to a little bit about the farmer's knowledge. Adrian sent me three maps. The first map made absolutely no sense to me. So I said, I don't want to go with it. It was too, I don't know what you call it, but when we've got too many zones that it doesn't make any sense, you've got a lot of real small zones. So I sent it back to him and I said, no, I want a, I want a map that looks like I can understand it. He sent another one and it was still too complex. So we just doubled it down. And he may have had that map right first go, but it didn't make any sense to me. So if it didn't make sense, um, I wouldn't have any trust in actually doing it. So um, in the end, we sort of, I went back and got Adrian to make maps roughly this size. Um, so we've got fairly big zones. Um, this, uh, this field here, Adrian showed those couple of pictures before. Um, we've got our farm split in three. This is the southern block. Up the top was the northern block that Adrian showed. Um, 
And what this is is a field view map. So we've got a, an app that plugs into our monitor and that's actually a harvest map. Um, this is the reason I wanted to do that multi-hybrid planning. From this year onwards, I decided we need to do something different because I had the map in the vehicle with me and we went down the bottom of the farm with the agronomist and I said, um, I started talking about variable rate seeding and he just didn't agree that that was the right way to go for me um, because sometimes if you can put, um, particularly with sorghum, if we put a low variety, uh, sorry, a low population in, that variety will actually till it really hard and it can do yourself a disservice by putting a low population in. So we decided to go down the track of putting two different varieties in. Now this was, in this season here, um, these areas that are cut out to give you an idea of what the season was like, those areas that are missing, the big area there and all these little ones, that's, they're there because we bailed that. Um, in hindsight, oh, I've got a baler at home and if anyone wants to buy one, I can sell it. And you'll understand why in a minute. Um, against my agronomist's advice, we, we've used that baler several times, but it certainly took a lot of money out of the farm long term for us. Um, so these areas here that are missing are areas where Scorpio grew really well and had nothing left to put into the head and we baled it because there was huge biomass um, for baling. We made silage out of that area, but there was no yield. It was going to grow nothing. And you can see the variation. It's massive. So we're down the bottom. Anything that's... I guess there's a bit of red. That dark red down there is 2.5 to 3.2 tonne to the hectare. The dark green stuff here is 7.5 tonne and up. And that field there is only 122 hectares. So in a field that's that size, to see that much variability, um, how can we have variability up here where we're only growing half the yield, we are 100 metres away. So we wanted to know why that was doing it. Some of those areas are low lying, but that's um, there's an area through here that is basically a gully, the rest of it's not. So we started to look a bit deeper into it and that's that's where we come up with the map. Um, what's interesting, when I show you the next slide, you'll see, to give you an idea, we, we baled all that. We've got a silage baler, so we just followed the header, wrapped it all up as we went. Um, my father drove the header, I drove the baler and I had no um, control over where he drove. So these areas here, if you just take notice of these, he bailed all that so he could get in there and get a pig chaser to go, come in home and chase some pigs and he got a bit carried away. But if you take notice of the areas he bailed and see how it corresponds with the next map, almost everywhere we bailed um, we had a yield decrease. So the first one, let me go back, Sorghum 2014, after this sorghum crop came off, we, we had a bit of a problem with zero till at home, but we had a problem with weeds, um, cat head in particular, a little bit of flea bane, and we decided to farm the, farm the um, work up the whole farm for the first time in probably 15 years. So we worked over it twice, the whole farm went back to bare soil, there's no stubble showing at all. Um, this here is Longfellow into Durham, so it's been 18 months, full moisture profile. And these areas up here are almost no yield. So, well, they're under 3.4 tonne to the hectare. Any of the green stuff is over 5 tonne to the hectare. And it's, it's one thing to sort of pick up this area that was bad, but everywhere we ran that baler, um, yeah, I don't know, it wasn't moisture, I don't know what it was. Obviously we've taken stubble out of the paddock, but there's about a tonne and a half to the hectare there, so the durum price is about 500 bucks a hectare it cost us just on that one pass, and I know it's sort of, it's not finished. My yield, actually the second crop, we've gone out of that long fellow into sorghum again, and they're still showing up. So some of the reason I wanted to do something different on our own farm, but. Um, once again, go back to where we were five years ago, saying that um, we've got all even black soil. And if, if you don't look into it deep, that's what we think. But um, the more you look into it, the more you want to do, and the more high definition you want to do it. Like you want to 
work on smaller and smaller zones, I think, once it makes sense. So there's two maps side by side, um, and that sort of blew me away a little bit. Um, that's a bit of a right map um, Adrian put together out of it, so two different varieties. Uh, Scorpio, the blue, Taurus in the red, so... Uh, and there's a couple of standard strips in here. In each block, I think we put one, so, you know, where it's Taurus all the way through, Scorpio beside it. Um, I've got to analyse that before I can give it an exact, you know, payback. Um, the one thing I took out of it, I think there's a slide further, is uh, the Scorpio far out yielded the Taurus. So for us, the payback is the fact that we put, or we were able to put Scorpio in because we could vary something, one of the inputs. Um, we took the ability to um, have a payback because all this blue area here, we were able to plant a variety that was 0.8 of a tonne to the hectare yield increase. Uh, um, this is the metre we use. Similar to the one I was holding up, except we've got one metre here, second one on the other side, and they just turn on and off simultaneously. Um, also, we've got the ability to variable rate, which we didn't mess around with the variable rate change in populations this year because I didn't want to confuse what we were doing. I didn't know what parameters I should work on. Um, that's our planner. Fairly simple setup, but it works well. Um, the only reason to put this slide in, that's Adrian's fancy logo we wanted to put in there. Um, on the right hand side, we're looking at hybrid Scorpio Taurus. The left hand side, we've also changed the, it's the only place we change the population. So those two maps, they show the same thing and it's only because um, we doubled the population when we came into the Taurus there. So the, I guess one of the main things I'm um, pointing towards is the ability, the, the technology that's coming out there is unbelievable. It's really good time to be in agriculture. Um, you know, some of this stuff is, it's got a payback, but it, it's also got a fairly serious outlay when you want to pay for it up front, but it's, it's great that there's people out there developing products like this that make it easy. So when we go to the paddock, when my father goes to the paddock and he doesn't know how to turn the GPS system on, he can actually go and use a multi-hybrid planner because all he's got to do is flick a switch and it works as he goes through the paddock. Um, and yeah, here's the difference here. Average, what do we average there? 6.7 uh, tonne over the lot. Scorpio 7.1, Taurus 6.3. So it's not a true representation, but um, I think I did the numbers yet, actually yesterday. 0. 0.8 times. Um, you got your phone on you? Now we'll work it out in a minute. 0. 0.8 times. Uh, I think it's 180 times 200. Twenty-eight thousand eight hundred dollars more on three hundred and ninety hectares. So the multi-hybrid cost me about a thousand dollars per row more to put on there than a standard system. So I've got nineteen rows, nineteen thousand dollars. So um, for us, it was. I didn't think we'd make it pay back in one year, but it has. Not based on proving whether the variety made a difference, but based on having the ability to change because I wanted to, and that's what we did. So. Um, an interesting technology I think that's coming, at least from our side of it, Adrian um, has spoke about sensors and maybe coming on machines. Um, Precision Plant have been playing with a seed firmer that we're basically putting behind every row and we're, with that we're measuring, um, got infrared lights there, measuring uh, the colour change in soil. So. I reckon this is going to be really good. When, it, when I went to the conference in the States, they normally got some whiz -bang product that really blows you away, and I'm sort of mechanically minded, so I see this meter that runs electrically, and that excites me. But when I saw this seed firmer, it didn't really... It, I wasn't really that excited for it, but as the uh, months went on, um, I got more and more excited because... This product here, as far as us selling the equipment, it's not something that we're going to go and sell a lot of them and um, have a good, you know, we're not going to make a lot of money out of selling a lot of these, but what it will do for farmers and agricultural industry, it'll 
gives the farmer the ability to collect his own data. Um, still need to be processed by someone, third party probably. But I think when you collect your own data, you start to take more interest in it. Um, this seed firm here, um, the ability, having the ability to put it on one on the planter um, and collect it on a nine or 12 metre swath width or 24, depends how big your machine is, or put one every metre and have a really high definition map. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be great technology. That also is collecting uh, residue, so any stubble that's in the trench, it's given us a map of that. Also, uh, moisture. So as we're going through the paddock, we know if we're dragging that seed firm through the moisture, um, well, we know we're in the moisture, we're, we're deep enough, so. I think that's about it. We've got one more slide. I've, I won't single anyone out, but I've seen a couple of people go to sleep, so I know I'm getting close to the end. <laughs> and just a little short video, and then, yeah, hopefully I explained a few things there. This is us planning at home. We used to fly the drone around a couple of times and found someone to do a video for us. I think I need to get Morgan Freeman or someone to do a voiceover for me and make it sound a bit more interesting. Get Adrian. Adrian would be good, wouldn't he? <laughs> Yeah, so it's just a planter using John Deere row units and we've got a central fill tank on there. Which is pretty handy at the moment. We're putting chickpeas there, so you can see the logo that Adrian made for us there at the front just for something to do. But you can see the different varieties scattered across there. We had a pretty favourable season this year until I think Christmas time and then the rain shut off on us and um, yeah, some of them probably could have done better but it's a pretty good result for us this year. Uh, that's about the gist of it. I hope I was semi-entertaining. I was entertaining as Adrian. I'm glad we had lunch in between that. <laughs> Hard men to follow. Um, anyone got any questions that I can answer about the gear or the cost of it or anything like that interest? Maybe if everyone's a bit more into winter crop there, we're starting to do a bit with um, canola, fava beans. Wheat's sort of a bit of a, it's something they're looking at, but they haven't mastered yet. Um, but yeah. You know what, Adrian was telling me some of the rates that some people dropped their canals back there. Oh, yeah, I think, yeah, I think, I think a lot of people are dropping their rates back. I've heard people around about 0.8 of a kilo, something like that. If we've got the ability to drop the rate almost as low as we want, really, um, within reason. So, but I've heard a lot of people definitely coming well under a kilo and, and not really having any yield penalty. And maybe, if anything, um, having a bit of a yield gain in areas where, in years when it is a bit tougher too, everything's got its own space and you finish up with a canola plant with a stem as thick as this. Um, but yeah, that's a, the canola is an easy easy crop for us to sell based on because our our product's got a pretty good price tag with it but if you're talking about um hybrid canola and you're talking about dropping from even two and a half kilos to one and a half kilos straight away you can put a number value on it and you can calculate a saving or a payback straight away so um yeah canola is a no-brainer if you're doing reasonable acres of canola there's a definite payback and you finish up with, like myself, 
you know, putting the multi hybrid hoppers on, thinking maybe it'll pay for itself in a couple of years. In the first year, it's paid for itself, not through the fact of the variable rate, but it's given me the ability to do something different. Whereas I think the payback on any of this stuff is you know, fairly quick. So do you use your <coughs> precision planner for wheat? Um, I will. I've only planted a couple of hectares with precision because um, when we grew wheat last, it's probably 18 months ago, more, two years ago, and we didn't have a correct plate, so I only planted a small amount, but now we've got the planter that'll do it, we will, and got a guy up the road from me, Anthony Martin, and he plants everything on his farm through his planter now. He's got an air seeder and disc machine, but he doesn't use the John Deere machine anymore. He uses a John Deere planter, and everything's going through it, so he's... I can't remember what he's done. He's probably done 1,200... I think it's 1,200 hectares of wheat through it. So what's the advantage? Is it just much, much more accurate seed placement, is it? Yeah, well, I guess it's spacing it evenly. Now, I reckon, particularly with wheat, when you're harvesting it and you walk through the stubble after you've harvested it, you can see all those gaps that are 20 centimetres long and just by throwing a few extra plants in there, I think it's the payback. Um, hopefully Anthony doesn't mind me mentioning it, but Anthony said that he noticed in his durum how healthy the durum crop looked. He planted last year and he's done it, just planted again now, he's durum with the metres and he noticed how healthy the crop looked all year round. It sort of had that dark green look about it um, and he reckons he's probably getting a lot less disease because the crop um, I guess there's not, you know, the, those two seeds that are planted together or land side by side have got, they're a weak seed, one of them or both of them are weak seeds, so they haven't got the ability to fight disease. Um, and he was really impressed with what he did. I think off the top of my head he was talking about something like 6.4 tonne to the hectare of durum he harvested last year off that. Um, he's